Hi there and welcome to video number 10 on the calculus of variations. This is the third example and one of the most famous examples called the Branchisto Chrome problem. Now the problem, put quite simply, is that given a ball rolling down a track from one point here to another point at the bottom of the track, the question is what shape of track will ensure that the time of descent for this ball is the shortest? So, for example, if we made the track really steep at the beginning and then shallower at the end, then it would accelerate fast down here and then it would slow up and the time take longer along this section here. We could also draw it like that and we could say that it would start off slowly but then accelerate faster and travel quicker uh, near the end. So the question is which path taken would give us the minimum time? So can we work out what that is? Now if we were to draw in some coordinate axes so if I draw that in there as our say an x axis and that there as a y axis so there's x there and there's y and I started off at this point here and I drew in my a curve and the balls travelling from this point here to this point here then we know that from basic physics that the starts off with a potential energy as a maximum so energy potential equals a max right and the kinetic energy energy kinetic equals a minimum and we know that as a ball rolls down this track the potential energy is converted into the kinetic energy and assuming that it's a frictionless track then we can say that the energy potential plus the energy kinetic will equal some constant value. Now also if we look at the change in the potential energy and the change in the kinetic energy then we could say that the change in the kinetic energy so they say the decrease so the change in the potential energy so they say the decrease in potential energy would be exactly matched by an increase in the kinetic energy energy kinetic so we could write potential energy is equal to the mass times the gravity times the height. The height in this instance here is given by y. That would equal the kinetic energy which would be a half mass times the velocity squared. Well the velocity would be ds by dt squared where ds is a small element along the path that the ball travels. So uh, we, if we cancel out the m's and we take the, the 2 up we will get our uh, ds by dt squared will equal to g times the y so ds by dt would equal root 2gy so what we're trying to do is minimize the time so from a calculus of variations we're looking to find out a 
characteristic equation function for this system. So we know that we're minimizing the time. Okay, so it's the time that we want to minimize. We'll just call that big T. We guess then to go from zero to some point x1. That would be x1 there. Now we know we just worked this out here that this is going to be equal to dt is going to be root 2gy upon ds. Oh, but pardon me, another way around about. <laughs> Not my rubber. There we are, back. Back, sorry. So we know it's going to be ds. Upon root two G Y. So that can be written as one upon root two G because G is a constant. Integral from zero to X one of root y remains in. Now this ds here, as of from previous videos, we drew out the Pythagoras and worked dy squared plus dx squared equals ds squared and solved for ds, we would get root 1 plus y derivative squared all by dx. So in this instance here that's a constant. This here is the functional or characteristic equation which we're looking for. So now we know that from calculus of variations this is explicitly dependent on y and y derivative. <coughs> There's no explicit dependence on x. So you can use the Beltrami identity and we can say that f minus y derivative of partial f by partial y derivative equals some constant c. Now plugging these values in, we would have f would be given by the root of 1 plus y derivative squared upon root y minus y derivative of partial 1 plus y derivative squared root upon root y by partial y derivative would equal some constant c. Now if we leave this as it is, I'll just put a wee ditto here, that minus and it's y derivative. Now this here will just act as a constant because we're not we're only differentiate with respect to y derivative, not with respect to y. So we could put this as 1 upon root y. And when we differentiate this term here, we'll simply have that's to the power of a half. So it would be a half of that to the minus a half. And then differentiating that would be 2y derivative. So the the halves and the two would cancel out. So you would just have y derivative upon 1 plus y 
drive with squared root okay now if we were to then take a common factor in the denominator the all common factor in the denominator would be root y times root 1 plus y derivative squared and work out what the numerator is well the numerator in this would be that times that which would be 1 plus y derivative squared okay and that would be minus y derivative times that's the same denominator so it would just be the y derivative would equal some constant now let's see if I can move on to a second page I should turn that page off page 2 ok well that's not going to page 2 there I'm not sure exactly why that is yes Moving on to a different page. Right, okay, I'll, I'll clear this off just now and it means I can go back to the top and start again. Okay, so now we would have 1 plus y derived of squared minus y derived of squared upon root y times root 1 plus y derived of squared would equal some constant and this will cancel with that and we'll have 1 upon root y times root 1 plus y derivative squared would equal some constant so then we multiplied out by the denominator we would have c root y root 1 plus y derivative squared would equal 1. Now this could be rewritten as we get rid of this um, here. Oh, there's a rubber here somewhere. And then there. Let's see. Ah, there we go. There's a rubber. So we could take the c down and then just call it a different constant because it doesn't really matter it's just a constant so we can write that there as a second here i fix my pen there we go. so we could write that as root of y times the root of one plus y derived of squared equals and um, it's just a, another constant now um i'll just give it the name i'll give it the value a value a so this here can we if we we could square both sides as well so this, this constant here would be 1 upon c squared which would be a so we can just square this end and that would be the, that value of a so we could have y 1 plus y derived of squared equals some value a and then we could say a upon y 
equals 1 plus y derivative squared. So y derivative squared equals a minus y upon y. So y derivative is equal root of a minus y upon y. So now we can write this out as a differential equation. So we would have dy by dx equals root of a minus y upon y. So we would have dx we could write as the root of y upon a minus y dx equals that by dy and then integrating we would have the integral from 0 to x1 of dx would equal the integral from 0 to y1 of the root of y upon a minus y by dy. Now, what we're going to do is, in order to solve that there, there's methods of differentiation called differentiation by substitution. Now, uh, I've seen several different trigonometric substitutions used in order to solve for this. Um, the one I'm going to choose, the one I think is for well, the one that I tend to use in this instance here is y, but y equal a sine theta squared. Now that theta there would be the angle that your curve would make between the horizontal and the tangent there. So that would be the theta there. Okay. Now, if that's what y is, then dy is the differential of that, which would be 2a sine theta cos theta and it would be by d theta. Okay, so it means that if we use that as a substitution, then we can put this value here in for our values in this equation. So we would have y would be a sine. squared theta. That should actually write that out properly. I'll get this rubber. That's right, sine squared theta. Sine squared theta. So be a sine squared theta here upon a minus a sine squared theta times the dy which is 2a sine theta cos theta by d theta and that's an integral from 0 to theta. That can be rewritten as <coughs> If you look at this section here, then uh, the if you take out the common factor of a, we would have one minus sine squared theta, which is cos squared theta. 
Of course, actually, I'll have to put the root sign in here as well. Forget that. Because it's the root of all of that. Okay, so that there, this section here, would just look like sine squared theta upon cos squared theta. So the integral from 0 to theta. The a's would cancel and we would have sine squared theta upon cos squared theta. Sine squared theta upon cos squared theta root. In fact, I'll just do that over here. Um, we would have a sine squared theta upon a 1 minus sine squared theta. That there would equal a sine squared theta upon a and it would be 1 minus sine squared theta would be cos squared theta. So the a's would cancel out and you'd have sine squared theta upon cos squared theta, which is that there. That times 2a sine theta cos theta, which would equal almost there. Um, the square root would cancel with the sine squared and the cos squared. We used to have sine over cos. Uh, so you would end up, if you took out the, the value of a, you would have a integral from 0 to theta of, that would be sine theta, times the sine theta would be sine squared theta, the cos theta would cancel with the cos theta. So you'd have 2 sine squared theta by d theta, which would then equal integral from 0 to theta of a. And that can be written as 1 minus cos 2 theta by d theta. Now, this here, when we integrate it, the whole reason for doing it was to get rid of, really get rid of the radicals here, the square root terms, we use the substitution in order to do that and we are able to substitute something in, a trigonometric form in and mess about with the trigonometric identities to get something that's a lot simpler to integrate and that's the thing that's a lot simpler to integrate. So if we integrate that, that would be equivalent to a Now, let's get this one right. So that would be a, that's simple, yeah. So that's simply going to be theta minus, and it would be a half sine 2, sine 2 theta. Okay. Now, we could take that and we could take the value of 2 out, so it would be a upon 2, and that would have to be 2 theta minus sine 2 theta. Okay, now if we rewrite that, and we let a upon 2 equal some value b, and we let our angle of 2 theta equal a single angle of phi, then we could write x equals b, and that would be 
phi, is it 2 theta is now phi, 8.2 is b, and that would be minus sine 2 theta, which is our angle phi. Now that value there would give us our x coordinate in a parametric form. Now we're going to look for the y value. Now we know the y value the, is a value up here. Okay, that was the identity that we put in. Okay, y was a sine squared theta. So if we see y equals a sine squared theta, then we can use the trig identity. If we trig identity um, sine squared theta equals a half 1 minus cos right it's not too good cos 2 theta now we can use that trig identity in here and that can be written as y equals a upon 2 minus a upon 2 cos 2 theta so y can be equal and if we for a to be in 2 we put b that would be b 1 minus cos phi so that's the y value so now we've got two values here but that give us our x and y in parametric form so we would have x would equal b phi minus sine phi and y would equal b 1 minus cos phi now these are the parametric equations of something called a cycloid and this is the description of the curve that will give us the path of shortest time now that'll do for now I'll go on on the next video and I'll do a quick derivation of a cycloid so that you can see that this here is indeed the parametric equation of a cycloid. Okay, thank you for listening and goodbye.